Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this quasi cyber seminar series research and observatory catchments, the legacy and the future. Um, quasi is very excited to host this series, which was convened by Jamie Shanley, Stephen Sebastian, Julia Jones, and Teresa Blume. Um, my name is Julia Masterman. I'm the Science Education and Outreach Coordinator with Quasi. Um, Quasi is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science, and our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through our data services, and promoting education in water science at all levels through programs like the Cyber Seminar Series. I would encourage you to reach out to me, visit our website, um, or sign up for our newsletter to learn a little bit more about what we do or to get involved. Um, I'll add that information in the chat in a moment. This webinar series is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel later this evening. Um, to check out last week's recording from the first webinar in this series, um, visit youtube.com forward slash Quasi. Uh, last week's talk was entitled The Global Catchment Map and Perspectives from Diverse Geographies. Um, so when you have a chance, feel free to check that one out. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please um, put them in the chat. There'll be time for a brief Q&A after each presentation uh, and a longer discussion at the end. So we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Thank you again for joining this cyber seminar series research and observatory catchments, the legacy and the future. This week's topic is historical hydrology and hydrologic change. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic to this week's convener, Jamie Shanley, to introduce this week's topic and our first speaker. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Julia. And uh, so this week we are focusing on hydrology, hydrology as a kind of a fundamental science within catchment science and uh, kind of the basis for a lot of catchment studies. You don't move solutes unless you're moving water for the most part. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, please, Julia. Julia Jones advancing the slides here. We have our catchment map update with uh, today's presentations on the map. There we go. Actually go to the next one where I think we have a little blow up. Okay, so today's catchments are in red. Last week's catchments are in yellow. Uh, near Georgia, South Carolina there, we actually have two, Santee and Panola, uh, and Hubbard Brook up in the Northeastern US, uh, the Wasatch Observatory in Utah. And my, my, oh, it's kind of off. And it's covered by conveners here, but I'm, there we go, <laughs> in New Zealand. Okay, um, so next slide. I think we might be launching right in. Yeah, I'm just going to launch right in to Jeff McDonald is giving kind of a plenary talk here. It's going to be 25 minutes with including time for questions um, to kind of set the tone for the importance of hydrology. And Jeff's actually bookending with a, a talk on his Mai Mai catchment in New Zealand at the end. The other four talks will be uh, how we're using hydrology in catchments. And um, I'm going to just hand it right off to Jeff. Actually, Jamie, may I butt in here very sure. quickly? Um, just a reminder, keep your comments and questions coming in through the chat throughout. I will be working in the background to compile and try and get them in order that we can present them. Um, but please do um, keep them coming in so we have some material to work with. Thank you very much. And my apologies, Jeff, for taking in a little bit of your time. No worries. And thank you very much. Can everyone see my screen and hear me OK? Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to be here and I appreciate the conveners uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to give a talk. And when Jamie asked me to do this, he wanted me to maybe cover some similar ground to a, a Berkeley Catchment Science Symposium talk I gave in December, 2019. And uh, I'm going to perhaps not cover similar ground, but in fact, go back farther in time. In that talk, I focused on the variable source area concept its introduction in the, roughly the mid 60s and what we've learned from then to now. This talk, I'd like to go backwards from the variable source area concept and think about how we got to that diagram. Uh, and this particular diagram uh, really influenced me. It came out the first year of my PhD. So this, this talk is really geared to uh, early career folks, maybe graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty who are new to our field. Uh, when I was new to the field, uh, 
this diagram was, was produced by my co-advisor, Andy Pierce, who himself was a PhD student of Tom Dunn. <clears throat> and I think a couple of things strike me with this diagram now in retrospect, uh, some 30 something years on. The first is that all the papers in this diagram are after 1960, if you kind of look at these lists here. And the other thing is that partial areas are wrapped under the variable source area concept. And these are two topics I'd like to focus on today. So the outline is going to be, where did early 60s variable source area ideas get their start? Uh, when and how did these partial areas get somehow wrapped under the variable source area concept? And I guess the most important question, why and how does any of this matter uh, today in 2021 with this great uh, initiative led by Kawazi and the special issue of HP? So this is the roadmap for the next 20 minutes or so. And I want to acknowledge uh, some work that's come out since my Berkeley talk uh, that some of you might have attended. Uh, this one led by Peter Schifford, kind of a community piece on how do we model subsurface storm flow if we're, if we're not able to measure it at the catchment scale. Uh, this one that came out uh, last year uh, led by Lee Lee, again, a community effort thinking about theories and hydrobiogeochemical uh, processes. And then some work that Keith has been publishing. This is an impress in Hess, uh, and he's published a couple of other really useful pieces in the last uh, 12 months. It's tough to compete on any history with Keith. He's both prolific and understands it better than anyone. And uh, we'll I'll touch on this a little bit as the talk goes on. I want to also acknowledge maybe a few truisms that you'll see uh, weave through this, this talk and through our history. Uh, one I, I found when visiting Dorte Tetzlaff and Chris Soulsby uh, in late 2019 when I was on sabbatical in Europe uh, at the Humboldt Museum. Travelers only possess the imperfect knowledge of their time. And I think you'll see reflections of that in our field. Uh, also, everything of importance has been thought of by someone before uh, who did not invent it. I think you'll see evidence of that today as well. And for me personally, as I look back, and I'm digging into this a little bit with a small book project I'm, I'm doing during uh, quarantine, uh, sometimes our history is a straight line and sometimes it's quite convoluted. And for me, what I thought was a straight line has proved to be convoluted and vice versa, as I'll try to show you a little bit today as well. Okay, so we're going to start with Charles Hirsch, because if you know, uh, everything in psychology is a footnote to Plato, I'd say everything in Kesman hydrology is a footnote to Charles Hirsch. I'm not the first to call attention to his work. Uh, there's a series of benchmark papers in hydrology. Two volumes feature Hirsch uh, papers, uh, Keith in the stream flow generation volume and Tim Burt in uh, the, the riparian zone by geochemistry volume. Uh, Tim and the late Wayne Swank have already also talked about uh, one of Hirsch's paper, the one by Hirsch and Brader. So Hirsch is a powerful figure. He was the chair of the subcommittee of subsurface flow of the AGU committee on runoff, something of a predecessor to the hydrology section, the first director of Coweta, and not a name I thought of a lot as a PhD student. Again, most of what I was exposed to was post-1960. And as you'll see, man, Hirsch really defined what we now know uh, many decades beforehand. Um, Hirsch was really the first to define the term subsurface storm flow. Again, we're thinking of a variable source area concept wrapper here. And he defined it in a 1936 paper as the dynamic type of storm water that enters the soil but moves away from the area through upper soil horizons at a rate much in excess of normal groundwater seepage. He himself was also influenced by work by Loudermilk in 1934, who together, I think both Loudermilk and Hirsch were thinking of these processes and certain soil profiles as neither true overland storm flow or nor, or nor true groundwater discharge. But Hirsch, I think, with the incredible uh, gauging effort and uh, well installation effort at Coweta, came up with a perceptual model that would rival much of what we see today. Just think of a CZO publication by the National Science Foundation. It's incredibly similar to what we're looking at here. 
we're going to come back to pieces of this diagram, but you can see in this 1938 paper, uh, it, real maturity in thinking. Look at the near stream zone on the left-hand side, the growing of a, a saturated wedge up the hill slope, uh, contribution of subsurface storm flow to deep percolation, to a water table mimicking the soil topography. This is pre-Toth, remember. Uh, on the other side, you're seeing more of an overland flow view. Look how he's thinking about that in the context of stream channels. Really quite amazing when you think this was uh, done in 1938. So let's zoom in a little bit at this near stream zone. Here you can see the, uh, the, 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 uh, the subsurface flow, if you like, uh, extending upslope in a very uh, Wayman-esque, uh, uh, you know, saturated wedge-like way. This was based on uh, quite an impressive series of wells. Um, already by the summer of 1925, I think, there were all, or, sorry, by the summer of 39, there were 25 weirs already at Coweta. Just imagine, and multiple wells. Here are some wells near the stream channel. This is a period of about two days on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you're seeing discharge from one of the streams. And here, uh, Hirsch and Brader are actually calculating the channel precipitation. So already they're realizing that for some storms, the flow in the stream channel can be explained by the water falling on the stream channel and the expanding saturated area adjacent to the stream and doing that with uh, quantitative measurements in the field. Let's do a reading from this same paper. I think what's interesting is that while some have identified you know, Hirsch really recognizing transmissivity feedback a long time before, you know, Alan Rhoda and other things came out in, in um, Scandinavia. I think he also nailed groundwater ridging. Uh, here is uh, uh, a small quote. It's possible that the slope of the water table at the stream edge might increase considerably during the storm period. He then does some simple uh, mental calculations in the next sentence. And then in green, it is quite possible that at some distance from the stream to the water table might temporarily slope away from the stream. So that's the groundwater ridge, but this would have no immediate effect on the rate at which groundwater enters the stream, meaning the ridge flowing back into the hill slope. And these, these, these calculations he's done with slopes in one and 20 to changing to one in five uh, are giving him an idea of how you could explain these contributions to the stream channel on the time scale of events. Moving up the slope, Hirsch also had a quite mature idea of subsurface storm flow farther up the slope and how that transmitted laterally downslope. Again, he's thinking about the link between not only the thin soil veneer, but weathered rock saprolite material below in terms of percolation to the water table. And a lot of his observations and in fact, there's a um, uh, written words by Hewlett who walked the field with Hirsch when Hewlett first arrived at Coweta, uh, hearing audible gurgling of water through soil macropores. Here's a quote from, from Hirsch, root channels and animal burrows of a, are of particular significance on the detention and storage and draining of gravitational water. He then talks about how a single earthworm burrow can drain heavy clay but then goes on to say, in like manner, it's conceivable that a few continuous void spaces may give rise to a rapid discharge of groundwater through a soil profile, which when viewed as a uniform pervious medium would be expected to transmit water slowly. So just think about that. He's already imagining water on the slope as transient water table, which we think of today. And he's realizing that once you get close to saturation, then all hell breaks loose in terms of preferential flow releasing that water from storage. Incredible, 1942. So when I look at uh, what I thought would be the setup of the variable source area concept and go back and read the papers from the 30s to the 60s, and of course variable source area concept proper was probably introduced in 1961 by Hewlett in a Forest Service publication. It's a pretty, straight line from Hirsch to this variable source area concept. But what about this second piece I wanna uh, focus on? How is partial area uh, bunged under this variable source area concept? 
And you can see in, in Andy's, uh, Andy Pierce's diagram here, he's including both infiltration excess aspects of partial areas and saturation aspects based on the, the papers you're seeing there. Let's, let's look at that a little bit. And of course, let's just review the variable source area concept. The best articulation of it, I think is from the uh, 1967 paper by Hewlett. Uh, and this was from a, uh, I think a 65 conference in P Penn State University on forest hydrology. Uh, it's when, uh, I, I, can't, I can't quite read the top of the screen because of all the zoom information, but when this, when this downslope flow exceeds the capacity of the soil profile, to transmit it, the water will come to the surface and the channel length will grow. This, in essence, is the variable source area concept. So again, just look at the diagram. It's kind of funky because it's got plan view on the left and cross-sectional view on the right, but this is really articulating what today we still think of as our uh, main concept of runoff generation in forested headwaters. Let's, let's look at this now in terms of this partial area piece. And I've come across a series of letters. Uh, there's uh, three of them that I have that occurred between March and August of 1970. And these were between uh, John Hewlett and Luna Leopold, another uh, eminent figure of the time. And it was before, uh, during and after the publication of the Dun and, uh, Dun and Black paper from Sleepers, where, where Jamie works uh, today. And it was focusing on this idea of partial areas and variable source areas and how to align them or indeed if they are aligned. And of course, there were some challenges to this variable source area thinking. Uh, this is from uh, Dun and Black, 1970. Again, a landmark paper and Tom, probably our greatest living field hydrologist. Uh, although soils and topography were generally thought to be conducive to subsurface storm flow. These are the findings now from Dun and Black at the Sleepers River catchment in Vermont. This mechanism was too small, too late, and too insensitive to fluctuations of rain intensity to add significantly to storm flow in the channel at the base of the hill slope. So this is really a, a different way of looking at things. And of course, some impressive mapping of the expansion and contraction of that saturated area but this was thought to be the, the real source of the dynamics of the hydrograph. And only 100 kilometers away or so, Reagan was doing work about the same time. This is another benchmark paper from an IAHS volume in 1968. Reagan wasn't looking at the expansion and contraction per se, but really monitoring in detail a, a reach and monitoring the groundwater dynamics and seeing, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, groundwater ridging. The, the materials were different here. Uh, Reagan was dealing with uh, outwash sand with a thick, thick capillary fringe, whereas of course, Dun and Black's work is in a more traditional uh, till material. But both of these studies are coming to a similar conclusion. It, it's not subsurface storm flow from upslopes. It's all happening in that near stream zone. Now, these letters are very instructive because it, it kind of reveals the the, the thinking of the time in a way that's not constrained just to journal papers. So here's Hewlett in his letter, uh, one of the letters, one of the final letters to, to Luna. Uh, Dunn and Reagan had in effect reduced the variable source area concept to a partial source concept, by which I gathered they meant a fixed portion of the basin, the area occupied by the stream channel and adjacent stream areas was furnishing all the stream flow or storm flow. He goes on to say that Dun and Black only mentions Hewlett and Hibbert's concept of translatory flow and apparently feels that to be the kernel of the variable source area concept. But here's really an insightful comment from this letter. Translatory flow is merely a suggested mechanism by which the variable source area concept may be working in some portions of the basin, not the concept itself. Boy, that is really, uh, important and I think useful for all of us to reflect on as we think about these different conveyance mechanisms from hill slopes to the stream. Let's go on and look at this because if you compare say sleepers and Coweta, they really are different beasts altogether. Here's a photo from Tom's incredible trench study at the base of a slope where he made a lot of very careful measurements, but look at the upslope contributing area 
to that piece of riparian zone. And contrast that with Coweta with very long, steep slopes. It's a very different kind of system. But here again, in Hewlett's letter, he's saying all he needs, meaning Tom, is more rainfall per hour or per day, and he would see his partial source area become a variable one. That's interesting. When I go back and think about sleepers, uh, Jamie and I co-advised a PhD student, Nick Hurt, uh, back in, uh, oh, when was it, Jamie? Late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, we, all, we all worked in another sleepers catchment, a forested headwaters, W9. Steve Sebastian's uh, worked there as well quite extensively, as have likely others on the call. Anyway, Nick put in about 30 wells uh, in the W9 catchment. It's a 41 hectare catchment and looked at the well response. Uh, looking uh, here, you see the time along the top uh, covering November to May. And on the, on the y-axis, you see depth below the surface. And you see that dotted line on the left showing your resistance to penetration. And what it's really showing is what's the interface between the transmissive mineral soil and the till and I'm kind of shading where the till would be in the gray. So what it, what it looks like is that the water tables are bouncing up and down and resetting at the soil till interface in a very uh, Alan Rhoda-esque transmissivity feedback like way. And when you take the hydrograph now from this catchment, so discharge on the y-axis, time on the x, we do a separation with 018 as is the norm these days, look at the estimated groundwater flux comprising those hydrographs. Some of those early hydrographs are completely groundwater. Now, groundwater is a loose term, and I'm not saying subsurface storm flow, uh, transient water table, or water table that's come up in the mineral soil to move laterally. But then this groundwater amount is decreasing as we progress through the melt event, where you're expanding the saturated area and likely getting more of that uh, saturation overland flow. But this may lend some support to the argument that Hewlett was making in his 1970 letter that I've only uh, just recently come across. Okay, so where does this take us? Well, really, I think uh, the, uh, the definitive review of catchment hydrology that I encourage all newcomers to the field to read is Mike Bunnell's 1993 review. And what he says here, is by the late 70s, acceptance of the Hewlett variable source area concept was universal, but research momentum in hill slope hydrology has continued, and I would say this is true today, uh, because a comprehensive understanding of process mechanisms or delivery mechanisms of storm runoff generation still remains elusive when referring to the headwaters of drainage basins. So, Again, why does this matter today? Well, first I think is that in many ways, uh, catchment hydrology is a, a series of footnotes to Hirsch. And what we realize now is, is what Hewlett recognized was Hirsch's impact and Hewlett's ideas, I think in the end have held sway. Uh, notwithstanding these really important papers, of course, from uh, Dunn and, and also Reagan and, and many others during that time, illustrating some aspects of variable source area hydrology. And if we think past the era of infiltration that Keith has uh, brought to our attention again, defined by Howard Cook a long time ago, you know, we've had the first international hydrological decade. We had what I might call the era of stable isotope tracing, and now the modern era you know, we've learned a lot of things. We've learned that uh, stream flow is mostly old water. We see differences between pressure and, and velocity. And more recently, we understand almost the universality of, you know, thresholds, connectivity, the transit time distributions, how they scale, and uh, the importance of storage and flow sources. Jeff, your four minute warning. Okay, thanks, I'm just about wrapped up. So if we go back to the slide from last week, and we think about this incredible effort, what are we gonna do going forward? Are we gonna create more dots? And I would say maybe we should start grouping dots. And this is an age old thing in science. Uh, Darwin said, science consists of grouping facts so that general laws or conclusions can be drawn from them. Or Hewling's Jackson, we have multitude of facts, but we require as they accumulate 
organizations of them into higher knowledge. And I think that's something that would be really useful to capitalize on with this activity right now. Uh, and there's been, been uh, uh, some of this already, a really nice paper by Frauke Bartol and Ross Woods uh, with about 30 catchments, uh, recent work by Julian and Rhett with about 17 hill slopes. This is really useful, I think, for our, our field. And I think we've come, we've come to some realizations as a community. I think that runoff is all some manifestation of some kind of filling and spilling. That's the emergent behavior at the scale of interest. So I don't think it's so much a uniqueness of place, but a uniqueness of scale. And if we could get to grips with that, maybe we could you know, begin to think of a, a, a Myers-Briggs-like test for catchment, where rather than you know, the, uh, the dichotomies that a Myers-Briggs test brings, introverted, out, extroverted, and so on, maybe our dichotomies are things like the integrated measures of runoff ratio, event water, transit time or wetness. These are debatable, but I think the time is right to do something like this. And I think it would capitalize on this special issue, uh, the seminar series. I think it would also resonate really well with what the modeling community is coming to realize. And that is the need to put the perceptual model at the center of the model activity. And I think this is a growing awareness that's really helpful for us as a catchment community. And in some ways, this is a bit back to the future. This is my last slide, Julia. You know, if we go back to a report by Davenport in 1946, this is a report of the Committee of Runoff. This is an, uh, 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 something I extracted from it the other day. The question was considered whether progress might be facilitated by the addition of one or more additional committees dealing with logical classifications of the subject of runoff. So I'll leave it there and just say that uh, going back to our questions we started off with, I really think all roads lead to Hirsch. Partial areas are indeed a, a, a special case of variable source area. And uh, I think it matters now because I, you know, moving to a, a grouping, uh, even if it's not a formal classification could be very uh, timely, particularly for this, uh, this group. And uh, with that, Jamie, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jeff. So we have uh, several comments already that you uh, you might be able to address. So first comes from Kevin Bishop, and he's getting back to the um, Hewlett's correspondence about Dun and Black's new idea. And Kevin says that uh, Tom Ho told him, Tom Dunn told him that Hewlett had been very disturbed about the implications of saturation excess flow for pesti pesticide fate and transport. Can you comment on uh, the environmental politics aspect of their dispute? Are you aware of any such uh, uh, yeah. discussions? Well, I, again, we need to get Tom on the call and I don't wanna channel for him, uh, uh, but it was a, an agency visit as I understand it, where Whipkey, where Reagan, where Hewlett and others came to sleepers at that time. And one quote I remember in, in a conversation with, with Tom at some point was uh, what Hewlett made in the field. You're throwing the field back to Horton. <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a comment that really resonated with me. Uh, but yeah, for sure, I think Kevin, you know, as it, that, that was a, also a, a big issue in terms of uh, USDA folks and others there with the obvious linkage to uh, uh, pollution issues and, and you know, saturated areas. And Solomon of them all points out something that you alluded to at the very beginning of your discussion by kind of alluding to that, you know, some people have known about these things before they're given credit for it. Um, in particular, he's, he's asking about um, some of the teleconnections perhaps between American scholars um, yeah. and what has, what was known by European and Asian um, scholars who didn't receive the recognition and particularly points out uh, Sukamoto in Japan and uh, also uh, emit perhaps a group in France. No, absolutely. I mean, heck, uh, Engler at ETH Zurich was uh, looking at uh, uncountable veins of soil in uh, subsurface storm flow on his hill slopes. That was 1919. Uh, Capus in 1960 published in Will Blanche, uh, a, a paper, a French journal. Uh, something very similar to partial areas. Um, 
the issue was at the time, I think many publications were in their home languages, same with Tsukamoto. Uh, and there wasn't the kind of uh, free flow of information. A lot of these papers I referred to today were from transactions of the AGU. Remember WR did not start until, gosh, I think it was 1966. So this is, a, this is an issue. And I think the more all of us can maybe think about our history, it's very helpful to understand and, and give due credit to how ideas have, uh, have evolved and, and developed. But of course, it can be quite difficult because it's in many languages. And I've, I've just you know, made reference to three only. What about the you know, Russian literature? What, what about other, other work out there? So Rhett Jackson is chiming in over the chat and he's pointing out that uh, Sukamoto had visited Hewlett at Coweta shortly before writing his paper. So uh, yeah. again, it's, uh, you know, the teleconnections, the interconnectedness, as, as well as the independence of ideas on, on display here. Um, That's a great point. And, and Hewlett at that time uh, in 1970 had just returned himself from South Africa, of course, later worked with Bosch and uh, you know, I, people were more mobile then than I imagined when I go back and read correspondence and, and think about where people were moving around. Uh, and certainly Horton was quite mobile within the country and a lot of Horton's early work, you know, talks about places in uh, Mississippi and uh, the upper Midwest and elsewhere uh, as part of his consulting activities as well. Thanks, Jeff. I think Julia's indicating that we need to move on to the next talk, Jamie. Yes, thank you, Jeff. That was great. Um, we'll have more discussion later. So next up, we have Devendra Amatya from the U.S. Forest Service talking about Santee. Sorry. Next up, we have Brent Allenbach. Uh, Brent is working at Panola in Georgia. He just got a paper accepted in our HP special issue, and he'll be talking about a small piece of that. Let's take it away, Brent. Thank you. The Panola Mountain Research Watershed started in 1985. It is a small 41 hectare forested catchment located in the Piedmont province of the southeastern United States outside of Atlanta, Georgia. The water budget at Panola is dominated by actual evapotranspiration, which represents 71% of precipitation long term and varies greatly annually from 50 to 87%. High potential evapotranspir rates in the summer typically exceed precipitation and these water limiting conditions result in water deficits such that the long-term actual evapotranspiration is 75% of potential evapotranspiration. Despite the humid climate, the study area undergoes reoccurring droughts as indicated from this time series plot of monthly watershed storage with drought periods correlating well with seasonal below normal storage conditions as indicated by the orange and red bands. These droughts affect water availability as illustrated by the background picture of Lake Lanier during the 2012 drought, which is the main water supply for Atlanta. Next slide, please. First, some pictures. In the top row, left to right, there's two pictures from the three hectare granite outcrop in the headwaters of the 10 hectare catchment. One is showing yellow daisies that are native to the granite outcrops in the Southeast Piedmont. Um, next picture, instrumentation above the experimental trenched hill slope and a picture of the trench. And then in the bottom row, a deep gully resulting from past poor agricultural practices, needle ice on the stream bank, a well network for the hill slope riparian zone connectivity study, the 10 hectare gauge house, the watershed outlet B-notch weir and the eddy covariance system. Next slide, please. The watershed storage base flow relationship developed for Panola in the left plot was used to make seasonal watershed storage traces for 30 years in the right plot. The colored traces indicate years with growing season droughts. Next appear, please. The hydrologic conditions that resulted in these droughts were either watershed storage that was below normal at the end of the dormant season combined with precipitation that was either below normal or near normal during the growing season next appear, or watershed storage that was near normal at the end of the dormant season combined with precipitation that was much below normal during the growing season. Next appear, please, thank you. Um, 
the setup to achieve these storage conditions necessary for the droughts were watershed storages that were either below or near normal at the beginning of the dormant season and precipitation that was below normal during the dormant season. So the point here is that the growing season drought is the result of low dormant season recharge and is dependent on the storage status of both the beginning and the end of the dormant season. Next slide. In the next two slides, I'll be presenting estimates of recharge from two approaches with recharge as a key to understanding the development of droughts. In the watershed storage approach, recharge was estimated from the increase in watershed storage associated with the increase in base flow from a storm. The validity of these estimates were evaluated from a storm water balance. Next to peer, please. Next to peer, please. Uh, recharge was also estimated from the soil moisture approach, utilizing profiles of soil moisture content sensors as pictured. Groundwater recharge is estimated as the drainage of water out of the bottom of the soil moisture profile during storms. Next slide, please. Cumulative water fluxes for recharge for the two methods are plotted here for 12 years. Variability in recharge estimates mimic patterns in stream flow and base flow, as shown here in red and blue. However, the recharge estimates from both approaches well exceeded observed watershed stream flow. Next to peer, please. Regarding the soil moisture approach, applying a plot scale recharge estimates to the entire watershed is not really sensible. The white areas of the watershed map indicate hill slope where predominantly recharge occurs, whereas there is also a substantial riparian area shown in dark blue where groundwater discharge occurs and trees have been shown to access groundwater, both contributing to high rates of evapotranspiration as opposed to stream flow. Furthermore, the soil moisture approach rechart estimates are sensitive to the effective depth of soil profile. Next appear, please. Two minute warning. Okay, thank you. Recharge from the soil moisture profile sometimes well exceed observed stream flow response. This discrepancy likely resulted from predominantly slow hill slope flow paths of recharge through the bedrock fractures, as illustrated in the cross sections, delaying the impacts of recharge on stream flow. These flow paths explain the long mean transit times observed at Panola, averaging about four and a half years. Riparian hill slope connectivity of the saturated areas on bedrock surfaces occurs infrequently. Next to peer, please. Um, evaluation of the reasonableness of watershed storage recharge estimates indicated increase in watershed storage during wetter periods that well exceed storm precipitation, as indicated in hot pink. These excessive responses likely indicate the expansion of variable source areas as the riparian aquifer below the granite outcrop fills for what is normally a losing stream as illustrated in the cross sections of the riparian aquifer. Meanwhile, an insufficient increase in watershed storage was sometimes exhibited during drier periods as indicated in orange and indicates the filling of storage that is disconnected from the stream. The point is that recharge estimate methods are informative but require some hydrological interpretation. Next slide, please. You've reached the six minute, so you okay. want to uh, wrap up? Yeah, so groundwater um, recharge estimates can vary greatly um, by year. You can see the first year only 11 centimeters of recharge occurred, while the following year five times as much recharge occurred. Next slide, I mean next uh, here. So plotting annual recharge versus precipitation for 12 years indicates that recharge increases in a nearly one-to-one -one manner with precipitation. However, the relation exhibits a 70 centimeter offset with precipitation, such that when annual precipitation is low, most of the water goes first to actual evapotranspiration and very little recharge goes to support base flow. With all that said, collaborative projects with Epinola are encouraged. This improves impact of watershed research and being can be critical for obtaining continued funding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Brent. Again, let's keep the any comments or questions rolling in through the chat window, please, and we'll move on to the next speaker. Yep. <clears throat> next up, we have Mark Green talking about hydrology at Hubbard Brook. Take it away, Mark. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm gonna talk about uh, our long-term water budgets at Hubbard 
Brooke. Uh, but before I start, uh, I'll acknowledge my co-authors uh, on a manuscript uh, that is in the interview for uh, the special issue. Um, all right, next slide, please. So Hubbard Brook is in the White Mountain National Forest in central New Hampshire. Uh, it's a mixed uh, hardwood forest, uh, about 1400 millimeters of precipitation a year, uh, mean annual temperature of about five degrees C. Uh, and we reach a peak of about a meter of snowpack every year. So it's a relatively cool, humid place. Um, we've monitored uh, nine experimental catchments, uh, the first starting in 1955. Uh, I'm going to focus on four catchments, four reference catchments that have not been manipulated uh, on the south facing uh, slope, watershed six and watershed three, and on the north facing slope, watershed seven and watershed eight. Uh, and, and I'm going to interpret a weighted average of those four catchments. Great. Uh, next, please. And, and I'm going to use, you know, the water budget that we all know. Um, our precipitation is equal to runoff plus evapotranspiration plus change in storage. Uh, we measure precipitation and runoff, so we're left with a water balance residual uh, that constitutes evapotranspiration and change in storage. Uh, historically, we've interpreted that to be evapotranspiration, uh, which is pretty much true, assuming change in storage is zero. Um, but but we're going to address that uh, here. So our, our long-term annual budgets uh, show the following patterns. Uh, annual precipitation, there's a lot of interannual variability uh, with a step, somewhat of a step increase. We lost our, our dry years starting in about 2004 uh, and, and haven't seen them since. Uh, annual runoff follows that pretty well. But if we look at the difference, uh, there's a startling change uh, that starts to take place somewhere in 2005 to 2010. Uh, where we start to, to deviate from a pretty consistent 500 millimeters uh, per year, which is you know, about what you would expect in terms of annual evapotranspiration. Um, we start to see a positive deviation uh, up to you know, about a 30 to 40% increase, 40% at the peak uh, water year that, that we observed. So the question immediately comes up, okay, is this an evapotranspiration increase? Uh, is it a change in storage or, or is it both? Uh, next, please. And actually, before we even go to processes, we should ask the question about what's happened with instrumentation. Um, when you're monitoring a 60 year hydrologic record, it certainly uh, happens. And so here's our, our quick summary uh, of what's happened over uh, our instrumented record. With discharge, uh, our fundamental measurements have not changed. Uh, we've gone to digital recorders uh, uh, within you know, the, the past decade, but, but that's not changing our height measurements. What has changed uh, is our pre precipitation measurements um, due to budget constraints and, and essentially a saturation of information. We went from 25 precipitation gauges to, to 12 uh, in June 2016. Uh, and then we changed our interpolation scheme at the same time. We, and neither of those uh, appeared to really matter for the record. Um, but what did matter is, is we also changed uh, to modern precipitation uh, rain gauges uh, that, that introduce uh, they catch a little bit more precip. And so it introduces anywhere from maybe six to 19% uh, increase in our water budget residual. So it's not negligible, but it also doesn't explain uh, uh, this increase in water budget residual. Next, please. Two minute warning. Thanks. Uh, has storage changed? Uh, the quick answer there is, is no. We, we don't have a long-term record, but uh, our soil, soil water and groundwater monitoring shows either no change or even decreases in storage in the catchment. Uh, next, please. Uh, and evapotranspiration, uh, there is evidence of an increase in evapotranspiration. So, so what you're looking at here uh, is uh, the, the annual uh, season length uh, based on the phenological record, the growing season precipitation, and the growing season potential evapotranspiration based on a Punman Monteith uh, estimate. And, and the, the growing season ET was estimated as the lower of precipitation or potential evapotranspiration. And just notice the step that occurs right in about 2010. 
and that constitutes about a 12% increase out of apotranspiration. We're left with more to explain, which could potentially be due to vegetation changes and thus the resistance of, of the canopy. Uh, next, please. And so to, to sum up, um, we're working in some heavily instrumented catchments, but still there's not enough instrumentation in place to, to be able to explain a big change like what we have observed. In particular, constraining storage is so important to being able to quantify evapotranspiration uh, and then within evapotranspiration, being able to distinguish atmospheric demand from vegetation controls uh, is, is what we're working on now. Uh, so with that, um, I will take any questions or if there's any time. Thank you very much, Mark. I, I do encourage everyone to keep questions and comments coming through. We will address them at the end if we have the opportunity to do so. Um, Jamie, uh, you, would you like to move on to the next presenter? Yeah, let's keep going. Um, <clears throat> Next up, we have Paul Brooks talking about the Wasatch in Utah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, organizers, and thanks, Quasi, for putting this on. It's been great. My brain is awash in all the information that I've seen so far, so I'm going to try to try to refocus here and spend a little bit of time giving you an introduction to um, a, a site or an area that maybe you guys haven't heard of or you probably haven't heard of it, uh, referred to as the Wasatch Environmental Observatory. So we're in the central continental US. Um, we're right on the border of the Great Basin and the Colorado River Basin. Um, we're high elevation cold continental snowpacks. And we're in a location where our water sources are right next to um, our city, our urban uses. Uh, and we're right next to campus. Um, it's a great place to address issues of water supply and link fundamental research to um, actual application and decisions. Next slide, please. So the WIO is, is rough, a concept that's roughly five years old and, and in practice, it's only three years old. And it's really uh, researchers largely at the University of Utah, but in other locations as well, uh, collaborating with stakeholders and collaboration across partner uh, departments and research topics to sort of bridge environmental fluid dynamics, hydrosphere and atmosphere uh, in both headwaters with urban systems and then the things that more people than just uh, hydrologists, the groups on this call care about what's growing there, what's living there, what's the landscape structure and stability and landslides, how do we manage resources? So it's, it's a unique opportunity to bring the research um, to the people that can use it quickly and really build synergy between related research that occurs in close proximity, but isn't integrated very well. Next slide, please. Probably the, 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 what you may have heard of is the Red Butte Creek, the, the US Forest Service Research Natural Area and USGS Hydrologic Benchmark Station. So for roughly 50, 55 years or so, it's been a site of long-term research. Um, in the last 10 years or so, the picture on the right shows Red Butte Creek coming out of the mountains. Uh, we've been expanded to include more urban research uh, along the Wasatch Front. Um, you'll hear, uh, work later in this series um, from Jennifer Shaw on some of the work that's going on in the urban areas. I, I think you'll hear from Beth Nielsen as well, a Logan Rib River Observatory, um, which is a partner observatory established by Utah NSF funding over the last 10 years or so. Um, next slide, please. So some of the research contributions from Red Butte Creek and, and one of the areas where I really like speak to uh, the questions of how does water actually make it to the stream? Um, kind of an accidental hydrologist, I, as a biogeochemist and toxicologist, I wanted to know what pollutants were getting to water from uh, uh, mine drainage or from waste sites. And I needed to understand how the water was moving through the system. And this figure here shows the gauge at Red Butte Creek and then data from uh, uh, the long-term, the, the HBN network, the USGS monitoring, shows this chemostasis and this idea of uh, complex flow routing to stream, whether it's fill or spill, various variable source area, whatever it may be, the, the routing is somewhat complicated, may, more so than maybe our simple engineering models that we might use in management suggest. Next slide, please. So of course the water that doesn't make it to the stream is lost to evapotranspiration. And some of the early work there from Todd Dawson and Jim Elringer 
actually identified this area, a, a sort of an early harbinger of two water worlds, or maybe there are more than two water worlds. And so streamside trees living right next to the stream, immediately adjacent to the stream, um, are not using streamside water. And then follow up work on that has said, well, they're not using necessarily the shallow soil water or are they using groundwater? So harkening back to Devendra and, and Brent's work and, and Mark's discussion on evapotranspiration, that's our big flux. The water that doesn't make it to the stream, there's a competition um, for vegetation use. Next slide, please. You have one minute left. No, okay. So, uh, so we've seen that movement of the water through the subsurface um, uh, and it subsidy for vegetation going. Next slide, please. We have a whole lot of really cool data, seven catchments, 100 years of discharge data, which is a waste by working with our partners. Next slide, please. And a huge amount of chemistry by working with our partners and prescient sampling of water isotopes and age dating of groundwater. Next slide, please. And what we see when we put 750 years of stream flow and climate monitoring is increasing temperature since 1980, but no change in stream flow. Next slide, please. Uh, and we see that every catchment is individual. It has its own individual unique response. Next slide, please. Um, what we do see though, is that there's a temporally coherent pattern in groundwater in water yield. And we think that what we're seeing is a multi-year climate memory. Next slide, please. That gets our uh, atmospheric scientists really excited. It's linked to a, a Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation of sea surface temperature, which propagates around the hemisphere controlling climate in the end and it collapses all our variable responses in the different watersheds into a very nice MLR predictive model, which works across all 12 catchments that we have in the region. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, there have been some questions coming in. The panelists are welcome to directly respond to the entire uh, group of attendees uh, if they want to through the chat, or we may be able to address them at the end. So thanks, Paul. Leave it to Paul to uh, be working in a watershed where he can do a lot of skiing in. Um, so we're coming back to Jeff now to wrap this up. We have encroached on our discussion time after, so we encourage Jeff to get through his talk and leave some time for questions. It's one minute past the hour now, so we have till quarter after. And Jeff is going to New Zealand, bringing us all to New Zealand. Let's go, Jeff. OK, thanks. You can hear me OK? Yes. All right, so thanks very much. And we'll talk about the Mai Mai M8 catchment and I'm billing it as a steep wet end member. Next slide. Uh, want to acknowledge co-authors on our HP paper, like many of you uh, were part of the special issue. And we here we chronicle the data over the last 40 years or so of repeated experiments. I'll just make mention of uh, three PhD students who've worked there, Chris Gabrielli, Brian McGlynn, and uh, Chris Graham, whose work I'll touch on today. Next slide, please. So gosh, back in almost 20 years ago, uh, Brian McGlynn and I and, and one or two others uh, reflected on the evolving perceptual model at Mai Mai. And we looked back 20 years then uh, to Paul Mosley's work in the upper left. This was uh, hydrometric based work in this small 3.8 hectare catchment. Uh, how that work was kind of overturned by isotope tracing by Sklash et al in another WRR paper. Uh, contrasting with uh, pipe flow of new water that maybe was part of Mosley's conception. Some of my PhD work that showed that both of these previous papers could, could coexist because uh, macropore flow of old water could be a thing and, uh, and then follow on work by other students. Next slide. But what I wanted to do just in the brief time today is reflect on what we've learned since that 2002 review. And one is a theme I think that's really come to the fore over the last uh, 20 years or so, and that's uh, thresholds and connectivity. Here you see about a five days of events, uh, runoff on the y-axis, a small event before you get to a threshold to activate the hill slope. It can be explained in a very Hirsch-like way uh, by almost a completely uh, 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 riparian zone water. Something screwed up on the slide I can see in the translation to, uh, to Julia. And then the next, uh, the next one, uh, the next storm, the hill slope is kicked in and you see the hill slope uh, activate. 
And this is happening in a very uh, hysteretic way, as you see in the piece that just flashed in. If we plot on the y-axis, the, uh, the hill slope versus the x-axis, the catchment. And uh, the hysteresis loop, the direction of that loop is different uh, if you look at the riparian zone versus the hill slope. Next slide. Oh, I see some funny things here with these slides. Anyway, uh, all of this, of course, when the hill slopes do activate, is aided and abetted by preferential flow. And it wasn't until working with Marcus Weiler and bringing in a, a preferential flow piece to his um, uh, hill V model did we realize that random soil pipes on this hill slope, this is the Woods and Row hill slope, could lead to very network like behavior, meaning these soil pipes, even though they're random, conspire with the lower surface that is creating the uh, transient saturation to induce lateral flow creates very network-like behavior and explains the distribution spatially along the base of this hill slope. And you see a picture of the, the Woods and Row hill slope and the distribution in red uh, of the flow at the base of that slope. Next slide. Two minutes, Jeff. Um, student Chris Gabrielli has put in about 40 wells down to 10 meters in this upper 3.8 hectare headwaters. Next slide. We've done age dating of the groundwater uh, using tritium with Uwe Morgenstern and Mike Stewart. And one thing we found is that when we model this and look at the depths on the y-axis here, that's in meters. This is a very, very deep early Pleistocene conglomerate that goes down uh, several hundred meters. More than half of the groundwater recharged in the Mai Mai headwaters is going under the gauge and subsidizing the, the larger Mai Mai Valley. And this is something I would not have expected prior to this deep work. Next slide. Uh, we've done some excavation. This is Chris, uh, uh, Chris Graham, next slide. All with an eye to try to understand the downslope travel patterns and distances. This is what it looks like when you strip away the soil and look at that zone, that interface where the rubber meets the road in terms of the lateral movement of water in this uh, hill slope and these catchments. And it's right down at that soil bedrock interface. Next slide. And if we look at, next slide, thank you. And if we look at this very nice summary by Julian and, uh, and uh, Rhett, uh, Mai Mai really is an end member when you look at downslope travel distance uh, and then the gradient ratio and the conductivity ratio in terms of the length of that downslope travel based on their uh, formulation you see in the upper right corner. So last slide, uh, going back to the theme of uh, Myers-Briggs test, uh, th th what you see on the right, that, those aren't my personal results. These are the results I think we'd find if we gave this test to the Mai Mai M8 catchment, uh, very high uh, runoff ratios. Just look at those numbers. The hill slope thresholds are not only clear, but they are consistent and repeatable. Uh, chronic wetness with very little, if any, seasonality. And this very interesting juxtaposition of some of the shortest mean transit times in the literature set against the ages we've been discovering in the, in the groundwater from the most recent work. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff and all of our panelists. Um, we're gonna just move into a general discussion now, but we're gonna catch up with some of the specific questions that were addressed to individual speakers throughout who didn't have time. And uh, you know, maybe one that, that I'm gonna start off by addressing it. So there's been mention of a, a special issue of hydrological processes, which uh, some of us on the call are, are guest editing. And um, that's a place, that it's a separate um, an independent exercise from this, but it is interlinked. So someone did ask about uh, the availability of data to Paul in particular, but um, what I'll point out to Elise, um, who, who wrote the question and, and also has a data note published in there, um, a lot of these sites are going to be included in the special issue. Um, so that's where you can find the particulars, but I'll, I'll let Paul and others chime in on what data are availability that they've presented today. Well, since you called me out, we've got um, a, a wide range of data available. We can go back about 40, 45 years. Um, we're recently forged an agreement with the management agencies to go back the full 120 years. Uh, but there's a government records and management act uh, that we process that we needed to go through 
but we recently got approval for that and we hope to have the full 100 year, 100 year data, um, 100 plus year data online within the next several months. Anybody else care to comment on their data availability? Again, I think it's one of the, the fundamental things that we're grappling with as a community of scientists. And I think the, the folks in this panel have a lot to offer. Um, Just a very brief comment on my mind as part of the, well, really the impetus was your special issue, Steve. Um, all of our data going back to uh, year one is online now on HydroShare and linked to the paper that's in press. So that was our, our main goal was to really make that available to everyone, particularly the modeling community. That's great. <clears throat> uh, Steve, if there's no other burning questions in the chat, I got one for Jeff. Um, so Jeff, did you not have any inkling from your water balance that you were losing so much to this deeper recharge pathway? And then well, kind of more generally, you know, I worry about this at sleepers, how common do you think this is, these headwater catchments that we think are watertight? We might have pretty large errors in our water balance through this sort of loss to the regional water. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's remember that that, uh, that groundwater recharge is a, a very, very, very small number. When okay. you look at the amount of rain and runoff, uh, uh, the, the, uh, so it's, it's a very, we're talking about uh, I'm making a lot about a small number, if, if okay. that makes sense. Okay, like how many millimeters? Uh, well, you know, 5% okay. of, the, of the input, something like that. Okay. But it's a slow, you know, uh, trickle charge through the system that seems to be, uh, you know, really immune to seasonality, unlike uh, right. several catchments. And we've got some recent papers on that. Um, Brent, you were kind of asked a similar question by by Rhett and uh, Rhett Jackson, and you responded in the chat. But do you want to give a quick recap of that question in your response? Yeah, he was worried about water going under the the gauge, and the gauge is sealed to the bedrock, so there was a hope that there would be minimal flow of regional, but. Um, Panola is at a high topographic air position compared to adjacent watersheds. And we do have a deep well about 30 feet deep that has dated groundwater of about 25 years old. But we are finding that um, there are um, horizontal fractures in the upper parts of the bedrock, at least the first two or three meters down. And that's probably how the water is flowing from the hill slope to the repairing area. So. It's not a sure thing that we're not losing water. Great, thank you, Brian. Mark, I think there's some similar questions to you um, from Jan Seibert. And I think he's, he, he wants you to discuss again the methods that, you're, that allow you to um, hone in on ET as being the response, the important response variable. And, and, but he's also asking about what's the, what's the error on that and could it be within the realm of error what you're seeing? I believe that's his summarizing several points from him. Yeah, yeah, and we've spent a few years trying to, to scrutinize all of these because we started to see our water balances behave wonky in like 2011 or so. And, and you st we have done some additional dilution gauging uh, at Weirs to, to try to put uh, numbers on this. And then that I mentioned the precipitation. That's actually a paper that was published two years ago, specifically uh, concerned about maintaining the integrity of the long-term record. So we wanted to have that fully documented for anyone to see. Um, no, so, so our conclusion is, is that the change is outside the, the potential error uh, at this point. But I have to say, it, it took triangulating that from lots of perspectives, including using GRACE uh, gravity data regionally just to help us see if, uh, if there was uh, any potential change in storage that we were missing. Um, we're getting close to our, our end time here. And I just wanted to, to again, reiter, reiterate a little thing, some of the things about the structure of this. And again, we're, we're cramming in a lot every week intentionally to provide a lot of perspectives. And, uh, and again, why I'm saying this is because we're in, in the final week of this and week eight, we're hoping this will culminate in a community dialogue for the entire um, duration of that seminar. So keep your ideas rolling along and think from week to week about what are, what's the synergy 
How can we work together? What are the community questions that we can address by, by identifying our individual catchments, our research questions, and think about how we can come together? And this, this ties into Jeff's um, uh, pointing out a possible exercise that we could engage in here. So again, just to, to kind of put the bounds on why are we doing this? Why are we having a discussion? And why are we having a lot of information um, provided at once? And and two, another important point is we're trying to balance some of the better known sites with some of the, the less well-known sites in this whole thing. So Jamie or Julia, maybe I'll hand it back to you for other closing perspectives or, or maybe a final um, discussion point that you want to address. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Steve just said. You know, the, the rest of this series up until that last kind of brainstorm meeting is going to be showcasing your catchment. So like Steve said, we'll have, you know, some of the better known catchments, some of the new startups, some of the, you know, intermediate catchments that you may not be too familiar with. So we just want to be showing each other what resources we have, what questions we're asking, what research topics are, you know, burning in our minds so that we can all get together on that final session and uh, think of ways to collaborate and keep this enterprise going. Julia, got anything for us? That's all. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this is again, the second webinar in the series of eight. So join us again next week, um, same time. Um, and we hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Thanks thank everyone. You. Mm -hmm.